one of the things that we've had to wrestle with as a nation for a long time, but especially for the past four years, is the issue, the question of truth and authority. That what is truth and who gets to decide what that truth is? Take, for example, the news. You know, what, what news media has the truth? And who determines whether that has the truth? And depending on who you ask, those answers will be very different. Is, does the truth lie with, you know, uh, a more, uh, you know, on the political spectrum, a light, a right leaning uh, publication, or is it on a left side? Is it on mainstream TV? Or is it can only be found on cable television? Or maybe none of the above, maybe truth can only be found on YouTube or on small, uh, small journals and small publications. Do those have truth? And who determines are those truth or not? Who gets to determine what is fake and what is real, what is true and what is false? What authority do we go to? Do we go to the president? Do we go to Congress? Do we go to House of Representatives? Do we go to Supreme Court? Do we go to public opinion? Where is truth? And where is ultimate authority? Now, this is uh, one of the questions that the reformers, you know, starting with Martin Luther, we're thinking about, and last week we started upon the five solas of the Reformation, that is the five kind of summary points uh, that the, the Reformers came up with that really encapsulated their arguments of, of what was wrong with the church and, and what needs to be changed. And last week we looked at in Christ alone. That is not Christ and something else. That Christ, Jesus, is necessary and sufficient for all that we need. We don't need Christ and good works. We don't need Christ and something else. All we need is Christ and Christ alone for salvation. But another thing that the formers looked at, and you know, probably if the, the week that we started on wasn't the Gospel Sunday, um, probably it would have started with this one, which is Scripture. Sola Scriptura, in Scripture alone. What was the Reformers' point? Well, the Reformers looked at what was happening in church and, and what was being said by the, the priests and the Pope and the bishops and all of that, and then they went to Scripture and say, for example, they looked at you know, Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. And Paul writes there, but, if, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. And then they looked at the teachings of the church and they said, wait, the teachings of the church are at variance with what we see in God's word, right? You see, again, those issues of truth and ultimate authority. Does truth lie with the church or does truth lie with the Bible? Does ultimate authority lie with the Bible or does it lie with the church? And the reformer said, ultimate authority about what truth is lies in the Bible. And that is why we call it sola scriptura, in scripture alone. That is not to say that there's no other authorities anywhere else. You know, we're not, uh, we're not saying that, you know, we should have anarchy and it's every man by himself and all he needs is a Bible. 
um, what we're saying, what the reformers were saying, is that the Bible has ultimate authority. And so other authorities, such as the church, need to be subject to God's word. And that's in contrast with what the Roman Catholic Church believed and still believes. Uh, in fact, after the, uh, the Reformation, to respond to a lot of the things that the Reformation was bringing up, the Catholic Church held a council, which is you know, a meeting of all the you know, Catholic uh, bigwigs and to you know, really hash out uh, a defense of the Catholic Church against the Reformation. And one of the points was about Scripture. And the Catholic Church said in the Council of Trent, and this was shortly after uh, the Reformation began, that the Catholic Church has ultimate authority over how Scripture is interpreted. Right? So you have these two very different uh, beliefs now. This is you know, the beginning of the great split between the Protestant churches and the Catholic churches. Where does ultimate authority lie? The Catholic Church says the church has ultimate authority. And Protestantism says the Bible has ultimate authority. So we're going to look now at God's word and we're going to see, you know, what, what this means and, uh, and were the reformers right? Can we see this in scripture, that scripture claims ultimate authority. And before we get into that, maybe, you know, some of us may be thinking, you know, since we're in America, we, we don't have uh, these traditions that the Roman Catholic Church has. You know, we didn't, we didn't grow up in a, in a culture where we look to an ultimate authority. We don't think of the church as the ultimate authority. Um, you know, it's the, the authority of the church has been degraded such that uh, many people think the church is only a, you know, social gathering. Uh, what, what would be missed if the church wasn't around? But the church does have authority. Uh, but, you know, even if we don't have these, you know, big traditions uh, over us, it is still very applicable because... Without them, we still have our own traditions. We still fall into these uh, traditions of man that the Catholic Church was, was falling into. And, and what even the Pharisees in the Bible and you know, even the Israelites were falling into. One of the, the main critiques that Jesus had against the Pharisees is that they break the law of God to follow their traditions. And let's not be, let's not delude ourselves into thinking we don't do that, because we do. Uh, we're, we're very much creatures of tradition and habit. And, and a lot of things we do do not have a foundation in the scriptures. A lot of it has foundations in you know, what was done before. And that's not to say our traditions and habits and you know, the way we do things is wrong or uh, you know, bad. But we're looking at ultimate authority. Just to give you an example, in, uh, in the American church, a lot of churches have this prohibition against drinking alcohol. And this is, this makes sense. I mean, this is not a bad uh, tradition to have because they see the effects of drunkenness and alcohol dependency. And so, you know, for the benefit of their congregation members, they say, no drinking. Drinking is evil. Look at where it leads to. Um, but if we take this tradition of, okay, no alcohol, and if we give that ultimate authority over God's word, then we come into God's word and we read it completely differently. And for the example of, say, alcohol, uh, there are many people who take to this belief, this tradition, that alcohol is bad and even sinful in of itself. 
Now, if you take that theology, you bring it into the Bible, now you have to reconcile, okay, well, we have a Savior here that turned water into wine. We've got an apostle here that wrote much of the, much of the New Testament who said you know, to, you know, to his disciple, you know, take some wine for your health. And so people who have this theology, this tradition, that alcohol is negative, come to the Bible and they have to make a, a change. And if their tradition is the ultimate authority, then that change needs to happen in the Bible. If it's if ultimate authority is in the Bible, then they have to make a change in themselves. And they say, well, this tradition is just you know a good thing and we can't hold it down as law. But if they hold it as law, if they hold on to the traditions, then they come to the Bible and and I'm not making up this people believe this that in the Bible, new wine is grape juice, right? It's, it's wine in the very, 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 very beginning stages of making wine, and so therefore, it's just grape juice. It's not alcoholic at all. Uh, but of course, that comes apart very quickly when you come to Pentecost, and you have the crowds making fun of the apostles uh, for being drunk on new wine. And you can't get drunk on grape juice no matter how hard you try. Uh, and I don't recommend you trying to prove me wrong. Uh, it doesn't have any alcohol in it. You can't get drunk on it. So there's, there's an example of modern day, the Christian church in America taking tradition, the teachings of the church, uh, the teachings of Christian culture, above scripture, taking that as the ultimate authority and interpreter of scripture. And so even now today, we still need this teaching, this sola scriptura. We need to remind ourselves that scripture is the ultimate authority. And if scripture is the ultimate authority, then if anything does not match what we see in God's word, then we are the ones that need to be doing the changing. We need to admit we are wrong and we need to conform ourselves to what we see in God's word. Right? That's what it means for the Bible to have ultimate authority. Okay, so let's look at the first passage. Uh, let's turn to, uh, well, since we're talking script about scripture, uh, 2 Timothy. All right, that very famous uh, passage about scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 3. So before we kind of get into Scripture's claim to authority, let's see um, what Scripture is and what it does. Does it claim ultimate authority? Is it useful? Do we need to supplement it? Do we need to have someone else, some other organization, interpret uh, and claim authority over it? 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Actually, that's, that's the middle of a sentence. Let's, let's go to uh, verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, may be competent, equipped for every good work. Now we see in the first the first thing that Paul tells Timothy is that the sacred writings of Scripture, God's Word, the Bible, is able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That is to say, the Bible contains everything that you need to know to put your faith in Jesus in a salvific way. That is, it tells you about who God is. It tells you about his holiness. 
tells you about his commands. The Bible tells you about the sinfulness of man. It tells you how mankind has, has disobeyed God, committed treason against the king of kings. And the Bible tells us how God has sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, into the world so that whoever believes in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. That Jesus Christ pays for our sins, turns away the wrath of God, and gives us his righteousness. All of that and much more. Everything we need to know about who God is, who Jesus is, who we are, how we how we can put our faith in him to obtain salvation, all of that is contained within God's word. What does that mean? It means we don't need supplementary material. It means we don't need another outside authority saying, you know, here's some missing information. Here's some extra revelation that you need. And this is the teaching of a lot of the cults that have sprung up, say Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, even uh, Islam. What do they all have in common? They all have in common that there is more revelation, that there is other authority, that what we have in the Bible is not enough. Or to put it in the language that we used last week, it is not sufficient. We need to add more stuff. But Paul says to Timothy, God's word contains in it all that can make you, well, is able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All you need is the Bible to tell you all that information, to tell you who God is, to tell you who Jesus is, to tell us who we are. We don't need any supplemental authority. He continues in verse 10, all scripture is breathed out by God. That is all, depending on your translation, uh, your translation may say it is inspired by God. That is, what is written on the pages of the Bible is what God intended you to have. That is, he wanted to speak to you. And he did so by using authors that have come a long time before us, writing it down, and God has superintended not just the authors, but the methods and you know all the various copies and everything, the 2,000 years plus from when the, when the authors were alive. All of that has been used by God to give us so when you, when you hold the Bible in your hands, you can say, this is from God. This is God's word. This is what God intended to tell us. And now that's a heavy word, and I know if you don't believe in supernatural causes, you don't believe in God, you know, that, that's not going to mean anything to you. Uh, it's not possible. But for us Christians, we believe in an almighty God. And it's just amazing that he superintended these, these letters, these words, these books of the Bible to be carried down through thousands of years, preserved so that we can still have his word. And that when we hold it up, we can know beyond a shallow doubt, this is what God says. And this sermon can't go into all the scholarship and all the, the proofs of that what we have is what 
was around the originals uh, when Jesus was alive or when the apostles were alive, um, but that is there and that is quite beyond the scope of a sermon. Um, so hopefully if you were in youth group when uh, Jonathan, um, Jay-Z and, and Solomon were doing that, you, you know, you, we went over that. Uh, we also went over in Sunday school, uh, adult Sunday school, a long time before that. Uh, so hopefully you, know, you were there for that. If not, uh, maybe you can catch one of the people that were in those studies and uh, get, uh, get some summary. Um, but, you know, do some research. This is God's word, and it has passed through the generations and centuries and ages to us, preserved as God's inspired word. And this God's word is profitable for teaching. It's profitable. It's useful. Right? It's not just a, an ornament. It's not just a, oh, that's nice to see. This is useful. Useful in our lives for what? For teaching. It teaches us who God is, who we are, who Jesus is, what the world is all about where truth is, what truth, what truth looks like, because this is the ultimate authority. It can teach us for reproof that the Greek word that that comes from is, you know, the word for evidence. It shows us what really is. And if we look at this, what really is, and then we look at our lives and it doesn't match, well, we need to change. We need to conform to the truth. And so it says, next thing, for correction. And the Greek word literally means to make something straight. You know, when you go to the doctor and you have a you have bad posture, you know, your back is all crooked, your doctor gives you, a, you know, an apparatus that will correct your, your posture. It will hold you upright. And that's what this world, word means, correction. God's word is that brace. It, when, you, when you read it, when you're into it, when you obey it, it makes you straight. You may have been going crooked, but when you conform your life to God's word, you go straight. And then lastly, for, uh, for training in righteousness. And that word training is the same word as a discipline that we looked at in Hebrews a few weeks ago. Um, so this is like child training, like you, you're training a child from being, you know, not really knowing anything to be a fully functioning adult. And this is what God's word does. It trains us in righteousness. It trains us in the way of God. It trains us to be like him, to be as he pleases, to be as he created us to be. Verse 17, that the man of God may be competent, or depending on your translation, uh, complete. <laughs> I, mis I misread it because I, you know, the version I memorized back in the day is co complete. Uh, or perfect, depending on your translation. Equipped for every good work. That is able to do everything we're supposed to be doing. Just like when you, you, know, when you train up a child well, it become, he or she becomes a fully functioning adult able to hold down a job, able to interact well with others, able to be a functioning member of society, uh, able to um, express what they believe and for us Christian families, able to uh, you know, put their faith in Jesus, Lord willing. And this is what Paul says the Bible does. The Bible is able to lead you in all things in righteousness, it is able to take you from someone who is not born, dead, as we looked at last week, into someone who is alive, right, that's verse 15, make you wise for salvation, and it is able to take you from being just alive and just born into a mature and fully functioning, competent, mature adult Christian perfect in every way. That's what the Bible does. The Bible is sufficient for every 
aspect and part of your journey whether you are not born again to born again to a little child to fully mature the bible is authoritative over all this part of your life no matter where you are the bible has ultimate authority now i see i don't have too much time left a uh, bit on our reminding remaining time uh, let's turn over to matthew chapter 5 Sorry, Matthew chapter 4. Because here we see the temptation of Jesus. And the most important part of this is not what temptations Jesus goes through. We've gone through that when we went through Luke. But the most important part is how Jesus uses Scripture. And, and this passage is completely mind-blowing because... Jesus, at every temptation Satan gives, if you're very familiar with the passage, you know what I'm talking about. Don't worry, we'll read it in a second. Jesus counters Satan's temptations with scripture. Now, when you're trying to prove something, you're trying to win an argument with someone else, you use higher authority. You don't use lower authority. If I'm trying to you know, argue with you um, that white is the best color uh, of all the colors that exist, you know, I'm not going to say, well, my baby daughter, well, I guess she's not really a baby anymore. My two-year-old daughter uh, says I'm right because I said, is daddy right? And she said, yes. <laughs> you know, that is not uh, authoritative in the argument. Why? Because she's younger. She doesn't know as much. And so I'm not adding anything to the argument because I'm not bringing in any authority. Now Jesus uses the Bible as his authority. What does that mean theologically? That means, theologically, the Bible carries a spiritual authority that is on par with God. Right? Did, he, did, he, did you catch that? Do you understand? Jesus can't use an authority that is lesser because it doesn't add to his case. It doesn't help him. But he's God. He can't use anything greater than God because that doesn't exist. So that means when Jesus uses the scriptures to fight temptation, to prove Satan wrong, that means when we hold up the word of God, this has the same authority as God himself. That's why we call it God's word. Because it's as authoritative as the one who spoke it. It has the authority of God behind it. That's very weighty. If you, if you catch that, it's, it's so weighty and it's so powerful. That's why when uh, King Josiah is is told when they're renovating the temple they've kind of lost the word of god and they find the word of god stored away in one of the walls and they bring it to josiah and he reads it and he just tears his clothes because he knows what he has is god's word and is authoritative and everything that he's been doing and everything the nation has been doing has been in disobedience okay but enough of a side note I'm sorry for the long side note. Anyways, Matthew chapter 4. And there are three different temptations. And I want to draw out three different uh, ways that Scripture is authoritative for us from, from this passage as kind of our application. Okay. Uh, so chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. 
But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, of course, with every temptation, Satan is appealing to a desire within Jesus. It's just like when we are tempted ourselves, there's something that connects with an inner desire. If it doesn't, then it's not a temptation because then you're like, oh, yeah, oh. Like if, if, uh, if someone's serving durian, I'm like, oh, that's not tempting for me. But other members of my family might be like, oh, durian, I got to have it. It's so tempting. It's got to connect with an inner desire. And so all these temptations that are given to Jesus have the root at some desire within Jesus. And the first is for physical bread. Now, Jesus is a physical man at this time. You know, he's incarnate. He's 100% man. He's 100% God. And he's 100% hungry. And so Satan says, make some bread. Make some bread. Now, Jesus could have said, no, I'm not going to make bread because I'm here in the desert. I'm fasting because I need spiritual food more than I need physical food. I'm going to start my earthly ministry right after this, and I need to be connected with my Heavenly Father. I need to be filled with the, the Holy Spirit. I need spiritual food and power. But he doesn't say that. He goes to God's word. And he quotes scripture. And he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. What does that mean for the authoritativeness of scripture? That means that scripture is authoritative, ultimately authoritative, over the everyday business of life. The scripture Jesus brings up that man cannot live by bread alone. That we need the word of God like we need bread. Or if you're Asian, you need rice or noodles, whatever the case may be. Or you need pizza. Uh, God's word is necessary for your life. It speaks not just to salvation. It speaks to how you live. It speaks to the choices you make. The Bible applies and has authority over every little bit of life. Every day, it's applicable. Every day, it's relevant. And so we must be in it like we eat food. Like we drink, drink. It is necessary for us. Next temptation that Jesus took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, uh, or wing of the temple, depending on your translation, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Satan is speaking to the desire of Jesus to be known as God's own, to, have, to show everyone that he has the approval of God the Father. Just think about for, uh, not first, uh, John chapter 1, that the word Jesus came into the world, which was his own, and his own did not recognize him. That's, that's like if you came home and you own you know, a few dogs and your dogs don't recognize you when you go home. You're like, they just ignore you or start barking at you in a hostile way. What you expect when you come home is a warm welcome. You expect lots of joyous barking and wagging of tails and licking everything. But what Jesus comes into when he comes into the world that he created amongst the people that he created, amongst the people that are supposed to be his own, is he comes as a stranger, an unwelcome stranger. And so, of course, the desire of his heart is to be known. 
that God is his father and he is the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But he knows it's not going to be how Satan does it. He knows he is going to receive greater glory, greater acknowledgement when he goes to the cross instead of just throwing himself down from the pinnacle of the temple and having God the Father save him. He could have said that. Or he could have said, Satan, your quoting of scripture is incorrect. You have an incorrect tr- interpretation. The scripture you, you quoted says God's going to protect you when you stumble. It doesn't say anything about God's going to protect you when you jump off a tall building. But he doesn't say that. Instead, he quotes scripture again. He says, again, it is written, verse 7, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. What is he saying about Scripture? He's saying only Scripture has the authority over Scripture. Not the church, not Satan. You want to interpret God's word? You look at God's word. And if an interpretation you're getting out of God's word doesn't match with some other part of scripture, it's your interpretation that is wrong. Because scripture is authoritative over itself and scripture is consistent. Now I know there are some parts that seem to be conflicting and some parts that are confusing and all that. I realize that and now it's not, you know, don't have the time to get into all that. But scripture does not conflict with scripture on any theological matter at all. Okay. There might be some, you know, differences about how, you know, some of the genealogies are counted and how some of the years are counted. Um, but that is not, you know, authoritative teaching. That is, you know, a lot of it has to do with you know, we just don't understand how things were uh, correctly, uh, you know, worked out in the timelines. We don't understand, you know, some of the genealogies. A lot of it has to do with our own lack of understanding and interpretation um, or with the author's, you know, intent. But, you know, barring all that, that's a whole different uh, subject. But scripture is authoritative over scripture. And scripture is not going to... Uh, conflict with other teaching of scripture and if our interpretation of scripture conflicts with other teaching of scripture our interpretation is wrong if the church has a teaching and it conflicts with scripture the church is wrong and if anyone else just like paul said in galatians brings a different gospel any other words something that conflicts with the words of scripture they are wrong That is what it means for the Bible to have ultimate authority. Um, Next temptation. Again, verse 8, the the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these I give you if you will fall down and worship me. Of course, this speaks to the inner desire of Jesus to save the nations. That's what he came for. That's why we celebrate Christmas this month. And this month is, we're in December. Congratulations for making it to December. We're almost done with this year, people. Um, But in Christmas time, we celebrate the birth of Jesus, the incarnation of Jesus. Why is that so great a thing to celebrate? It's because he came in this world to die for sinners, to liberate us from the power of sin and death. And here Satan is saying, all that you've done to all you've came to accomplish, rescuing humankind from my authority, Satan says, I'll, I'll just give them to you. You don't have to go to the cross, you don't have to die, you don't have to suffer, you don't have to you know, be spat upon, you don't have to be tortured, none of that. All you have to do is just bow down and worship me, right? On on the outside, it looks like a great deal. All of what Jesus wants. 
with just a small little compromise. But Jesus responds, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. That is, Scripture is authoritative over ourselves, our own desires, our own passions. All of what we want. Scripture is authoritative over that. And this is a great word, especially for us Americans, because we are we are not like the Roman Catholics. We are not at the time of Martin Luther. We are not, you know, built into these rigid systems of tradition and hierarchy. We are very individualistic in this country, in the West. And even if we're from a minority group, we're greatly influenced by the individualism in this country. Let me highlight this with uh, something that happened to me when I came out of seminary and I was serving in a church and uh, they didn't have a past they didn't have an English pastor at the time, so I was helping. And they had they had regular speakers, and one of the regular speakers sat down with me one day and he hadn't gone to seminary. He knew I just came right out of seminary and, and he said to me, you are prideful because knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. What was he saying? He wasn't making a character, uh, you know, call on who I was. He was saying, you went to school for the Bible. You went to seminary, so therefore, you are filled with pride. But I did not go to seminary, so therefore, I can build up in love. That was what I was saying. Now, in America, we might not, you know, other people might not say this as boldly, but we say, you know, no authority but scripture. I reject the, you know, whatever authority of the Catholic Church. I, I reject all those other people trying to tell me what I believe. I see the Bible and I read it for myself. But we're saying the same thing that that preacher said. Who has ultimate authority? I do. I'm not going to depend on any other pre preachers. I'm not going to depend on any commentaries, on any other teachers. I alone can interpret God's word. That's what he said. Now, of course, we're not as bold to come out and say that, but we see this when we go to Bible studies too often. You know, you go to, you go to your college Bible study, you go to other Bible studies, and then what do they do? They read God's word and they say, you go around the circle. What does the passage mean to you? And after an hour, an hour and a half of sharing, you have everyone's opinion about what the Bible means to them. But after all that time, you have no idea what the passage actually means. Why? Because every person is their own greatest authority on God's word. That's the result of individualism and the Bible. We hold ourselves to be the greatest interpreter of Scripture. But here, Jesus says, this is not so. The Bible is the ultimate authority over us. And if we don't match, then I have to change. My passions, my desires, what I long for must conform to the words of Holy Scripture. It has authority over me, not the other way around. So Scripture has ultimate authority over everyday life over scripture itself and over 
ourselves, our desires. Now, if this is so, and the Word of God says it is, then we must be in it. We must be in it. It's not enough to just, you know, listen to sermons. And what we're doing right now is great. This is why, actually, preaching is one of the big things that came out of the Reformation. Because if you look at a Catholic church, what's, what's the center in the Catholic church? The center is the Lord's Supper. It's that table in front. That's the main part of a Catholic service. But you go to a Protestant church. You go to our church. Where is the center? The center, the highlight, is the pulpit. It's where the Word of God is spoken and read and expounded. That's why Protestant churches are all about God's word. Because we hold this to be our ultimate authority. And so we must be people of the word. Not just on Sundays though. And it's great listening to a sermon. But we've got to be in the word all week. If this is ultimate authority. If this has authority over the way we live our lives day to day as as Jesus quoted, that man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God, that we've got to be in this to live. We've got to be in this as much as we're in breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We should be able to say, if we're tempted by food, I need spiritual food. As much, if not more, than I need physical food. And maybe during this quarantine pandemic time, a lot of us have been putting on weight because there's nothing else to do but eat and we can't get proper exercise. And, uh, and maybe a lot of us are exper- you know, experimenting with new recipes and you know, that's just kind of how life is, always spending it at home. But if this is ultimate authority, if this is what Jesus said it is, then we must be in it. We should be getting as fat on God's word as we are getting fat on physical food. We should have to go out and buy spiritual genes that are two sizes bigger because our spiritual body is growing. Our spiritual waist should be growing larger than our physical waist. I'm sorry, I'm using such a (laughs) kind of obscene uh, way of talking about it, but this is the truth. This is authority. And uh, we're almost on a new year. Uh, New year is a great time, if you haven't this year, to try a reading plan for getting through the Bible. To try to read through God's Word at least once next year. And so if you're interested, you know, maybe write something in the chat or maybe message me and, and we'll try to get a reading group together, you know, where we can read God's Word together and encourage one another uh, and, and, you know, make sure that we read the Bible together through uh, the span of 2021 and we all get through God's Word at least once together, okay? Uh, or do it on your own. There's plenty of good uh, Bible reading tracking or plans out there and, and maybe I'll link some of those in the description. But those are great resources for you to really get into God's Word in the coming year. Now, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, Lord, we confess our, our sinful tendency to put the traditions of man or our own traditions, our own priorities and desires over that of your word. And we don't want to come to your word and have the uncomfortable situation of 
having to change everything that we're doing and having to change the way we live and the way that we operate and, and how we approach things. Uh, but Lord, your, your word is profitable. It is useful for teaching us, for, for rebuking us, for correcting us, and for training us up in righteousness. For every stage of life that we are at, the Bible has authority over us. So because that Bible has the ultimate authority, Lord, help us to submit to your word. That what it says to do, we will do. What it says to go, we will go. What it says to bear, we will bear. What it says to correct, we will correct. Lord, that we may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, and trained perfectly in righteousness. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.